Hey there, everyone. Just getting set up here. Welcome, welcome. Just give me a few minutes to check in. I've got a couple screens going and I want to make sure you guys can hear me. So if you can hear me, if you can see me, be kind enough to put a uh, comment in the box here. Let's see. Oh, we've got a few people coming into the room. Welcome, welcome. Let's see here. Just letting folks get come uh, just letting folks get into the room here. Can you guys hear? Yes, no, maybe, sort of. I don't want to dive in until I know that um, that we have audio. Sometimes there's issues, you know. Let's see here. Hey, thank you, Viola. Thank you, Christina. I see Wins here. Hey, Elena. Hey, Aubrey. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you guys? How's everyone's Mercury retrograde going? Uh, oh, I, I can't. I just can't even. <laughs> some of the people in the group witness some of my, shall we say, challenges with Mercury retrograde this week. Um, but yeah, we do what we can do, right? We do what we can do. Well, and the sleep shades, well, Sleep is the most important meal of the day, folks. It really is. I mean, it, the dreams feed our souls, and it's nutrition for spirit, no matter what your tradition. So, but we'll get into all that. We've got some more people coming in. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, you know, first things first, before we dive into to plants and dreaming, I just want to take a moment to thank Christina for hosting and inviting me, inviting all of us to the Summer of Magic. Um, I'm Renee Lynn. I'm the founder. Um, I always want to say headmistress, but that sounds a little too kink. But, you know, this is a progressive crowd of, of the Spirit Phoenix Academy. And welcome to Psychic Delic Baby, planting the seeds of lucid and liminal dreaming. This is the second talk in the Profitable Psychic Summer of Magic series, a.k.a hotline girl summer <laughs> you know and i say that because there are so many people in the group from our psychic hotline groups and i don't say hotline girl summer to intentionally exclude any of our he hisses any of our uh, you know they thems in our group you know the psychic hotline community the magical community community is a pretty you know inclusive group right but at the same time we are exclusive and what what is that about well it's because we aren't afraid of our gifts, our clairs. You know, we're not afraid to, to you know, live with them and, and love with them and incorporate them in our daily lives. So, hence, Hotline Girl Summer. Anyway, yeah, but we've got mediums here. We've got magicians. We've got fair fey folk, which is hard for me to say three times fast. So, lots of intersecting circles in our group, and I just want to say welcome and come one, come all. And, you know, I'm so happy that we embrace the gifts. Now, speaking of gifts, I know some of us don't have time to stay for the whole talk today, you know, and God knows I can go on and on. But um, I've got several little gifties for us, one of which you might be able to see behind me. Where is it? Right there. I've got this. Um, this is the most like popular thing in my Etsy, right? Um, I have these amazing black lace dream catchers, these protective dream catchers. So one of the gifts that I'm giving today, I'm doing a drawing uh, later on and I'll explain how to enter. Uh, so one of those little babies can be yours and hang on your wall and send your nightmares a packing and grab onto those beautiful, good prophetic dreams that we're all seeking, those lucid dreams that we're all seeking. Um, in addition to that, I have a lovely ebook that gets you going on, you know, seeding your lucid dream practice and your liminal states of consciousness. And we'll explain a little bit more in just a bit about what those different things are and how, um, you know, plants can be involved in that. There's all sorts of things that we can do to, to enhance this practice, right? A lot of us hear about lucid dreaming, but we don't usually have a clue about how to do that unless you're already a practitioner. Ooh, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting some, some good woohoos from, from the group here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. But yeah, um, 
so many great talks this week, right? About animal medicine and, and plant magic. It's making me feel my shaman matrix roots, you know? So how many plant people do we have in the room? Who's here? Who's here? Checking for comments, seeing who my plant people are, who my animal people are. And some of us cross over into both disciplines, right? Right. Anyway, for folks who are just coming in and just joining us again, my name's Renee Lynn. I'm with the Spirit Phoenix Academy. And I have a little webcast uh, called the Spirit Phoenix Rising Show. You maybe have seen me lurking about in some of Christina's groups. Or, you know, she's got several groups that a lot of us magical and um, intuitive folks flock to. Um, essentially, I feel called to help folks who are in professional and personal transition and crises, because sometimes I do shadow work. I help folks discover their life purpose and their personal branding as well as arming folks with tools and tricks for self-healing and sacred self-discovery. Another thing I love to work with folks on is the art of manifestation, you know, so lots of um, different disciplines, you know, they always say find your niche and focus on that one thing. That has always been so hard for me. I mean, I'll often speak to the fact that my name is Renee, which means to be reborn. And it's the root of the word renaissance and we we've heard for you know eons about the renaissance man a person who is excited and um, eager to work in many different disciplines using different gifts so that's always been me i've always been like ooh, what's that shiny thing over there Ooh, what's that you know no shame in wanting to explore the different facets of the clairs and magic and mystery and mysticism you know <laughs> we got a crazy plant person here. That's Miss Christina. Oh, you know, I I got to show you. I ha I wore this for your talk today. Can you see that? See, we got my little serpent bracelet on, but I'm I'm flocking with the greens today for all the plants. But <laughs> Oh, we Elena's into her herbal teas. Danny, is that your name? Am I pronouncing it correctly? I know people mispronounce me all the time. So you're an animal, but definitely love the act of creating incense blends. You know what? Uh, there are a few folks this week, I think uh, it's Desiree and Amanda, who will be talking about uh, using essential oils, etc. In fact, as a part of my free gifts today, I do have a little blend recipe with one of the plants I'm going to talk about. It's sort of like a an Egyptian kind of perfume vibe that I think you guys might find enticing. And it's got some variants in it, so you can personalize it for yourself as well. But um, yeah, make sure you come back this week to check out those talks too. Check, check out everything. I mean, my gosh, what a fulfilling week we have here, you know? Um, hey, are there any lucid dreaming practitioners in the room? I have, is anyone in here already kind of down with the vibe of lucid dreaming? Oh, hey, Katie, welcome. I think I said hi to Lynn earlier, you know? Yeah, lucid dreaming, you know? Um, how many people saw the film Inception? Remember Inception where each and every character in the film gets injected with a compound, a substance that, um, you know, puts them into this like mystical world of lucid dreaming, right? You know, as I said, a lot of people hear the term, but they're not quite sure, sure what it's about. I mean, simply put, a lucid dream is a conscious dream. It's a dream in which the dreamer realizes they're dreaming in the dream, outside of the dream. They know they're dreaming. You know you're dreaming. All right. You're aware of it. From researchers to writers to artists, you know, magical folk, anyone, I mean, anyone can be trained to have lucid dreams and learn about practical techniques to deepen their abilities, right? And this, this dream state is often very prophetic. It can be healing. And this is what I think makes it a great topic for Summer of Magic for professional and aspiring psychics, uh, Claire people. It, it's a wonderful thing. It's a very shamanistic thing. Um, you know, we're going to talk about liminal dreams and liminal states of dream consciousness as well. And not many people are familiar with this term. 
the word liminal, the liminal state is a transition between one stage to another. And my dear friend, um, researcher Jennifer Dumpert, she's an author and, and calls herself a dream hacker. She tells us that, I have a quote from her, at the edge of consciousness, between waking and sleeping, there's a swirling free associative state of mind that is the domain of liminal dreams. Working with liminal dreams can improve sleep, mitigate anxiety, and what else did she say here? Um, depression, heal trauma, and aid in creativity and problem solving. So um, Jennifer really was the one to sort of coin this phrase, liminal dreaming. Of course, the word's been around in our, you know, our linguistic world for so long, but, you know, putting this idea of liminal and dreaming together is really something that she's been on the ground floor of researching. Ah, could it be related to scrying, working with mirrors and candles while speaking to another world, Elena asks. You know, I would say yes, because when we get into this, uh, especially the liminal state of consciousness where we're on the edge, we are tapping in to that exact same space. I, I say yes. Aubrey says she has always been a lucid dreamer since she was younger. Can't remember when it began, but... Um, got control over it. Okay. Heidi. Hey, Heidi. Welcome. A little bit of a lucid dreamer here. Yeah. Yeah. Christina Vila, you know. Um, so yeah, we're going to chat a bit. If you just came in the room about working with certain plants to aid this practice, we're going to talk about uh, techniques in these states and, you know, how to get through to that, you know, and, and sort of pierce the veil into lucid and liminal dreaming. Sound good to you guys? Yeah. I hope. <laughs> anyway, so my husband is my loaf coach. Yeah, loaf coach, not life coach. I'm the life coach in the family. He is the loaf coach, right? He's always trying to get me to slow the F down, right? But you see, he's a master, a master lucid dreamer, okay? Um, when we first started dating, I marveled at the stories he would tell me upon waking up, you know, his dreams were like, I don't know, super huge and adventurous and heroic and, and cinematic, like on the level of like a Michael Bay movie, right? And then I would witness him time and time again, closing his eyes and diving right back into that same dream with intentions. I mean, sometimes he just wanted to come in and and play the role he was already assigned. But other times he went in with the intention to control and alter the outcome, right? He would dive right back into the dreamscape with intention, right? Meanwhile, I was convinced that I didn't even have dreams. I, I couldn't remember my dreams. Um, while he was able to fall asleep at the drop of a hat, it's like my entrepreneurial neurons were constantly firing till 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, and it took me forever to sort of, well, I guess turn off and tune out, right? You know, I'm a light sleeper and he could snooze through like the biggest earthquake. So I was the type of person that would wake up easily. I, I still do. So now I use, you know, ambient soundscapes in my room and and little tips and white noise tricks to help lull me away from anything that might jar me out of sleep. But yeah, short sleep cycles, not much REM, not much REM to speak of. And that's where the lucid dreamscapes happen is when we're deep into REM sleep, you know. And I said it earlier today, you know, I've got my sleep shades on, you know, because sometimes I'll even use them in the middle of the day to zone out and enter into a liminal space. But um, I said at the beginning, sleep is the most important meal of the day, people, because having a good sleep um, practice, if you will, is laying the bedrock, the groundwork, the foundation for a lucid dreaming practice. So, oh, um, you know, I mentioned we're going to be talking about plants today, psychoactive plants, and that doesn't necessarily mean ingestion. There's so many different ways to prepare and work with these plant allies. But um, 
I've been for decades now uh, involved as an advocate, a volunteer, a part-time researcher in the realm of psychedelics and decriminalization. My master's thesis surrounded hallucinogens and altered states of consciousness. And dreams really are the original altered state. So if you're interested in the history of certain psychoactives, right? Um, if you're interested in um, how they're being used now legitimately, right? Um, approved by governments as medicine, especially um, things that are making headway in healing uh, trauma, PTSD, uh, specifically MDMA. I have been working with Connie Littlefield, a wonderful documentary filmmaker from Canada, on a project called Better Living Through Chemistry. And this film was 20 years in the making. It's in the can now. At the end, I'll share a trailer for it. But um, this film uh, follows the pioneering godparents of the psychedelic scene, Anne and Sha Sasha Shulgin. He was credited with um, developing over 230 psychoactive compounds that are based on sacred plants. Um, and then his wife, Anne Shulgin, she is the OG underground psychedelic therapist. So uh, she has a background in uh, Jungian symbology, etc. But, you know, they were quite the power couple. So um, as a matter of fact, their work inspired me to start working on the psychedelic Renaissance tarot deck. So I've been working on that, um, highlighting the light bringers and the chemists and the luminaries of the movement. But the reason I bring that up is because um, being part of that subculture, having this deep interest in the history and the awareness of the power of plants, that you know they help us do virtually any type of healing. So not being able to sleep well, I turn to plant medicine, the simple things. Um, I started working with Damiana and Valerian root mixed with a little chamomile to help me get to sleep at night. But soon, my interests and in research grew to include other sleep and dream-friendly plant allies. And there are several plants out there that want to help us in the dream space, right? You know, I always think back to Wizard of Oz and the poppy fields, you know, there, there are plants that can help us rest. And boy, did I need to access them because on my own, you know, like, blah, 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 monkey brain just would not turn off at night, you know? So it wasn't too long before I turned to a magical herb that has a long history with folks like us, and that is mugwort, right? Do we have any mugwort fans out here? I, I should actually check in with you guys. Uh, light sleeper here, Christina Quick. You know, um, there is a, a, a phenomenon that, you know, I've read about in the media and uh, it's called the night divorce. Okay. Anyone here, a night divorcee? You know, when I was a little girl, I noticed at some point my parents started to sleep separately. And, you know, as a, a young kid, I was like, oh, is something wrong? What's going on? Will they get a divorce? No, but <laughs> it's the night divorce. Um, if you've got a husband that tosses and turns or a partner or a wife, you know, somebody who um, has a different sleep style than you, sometimes it's really a wise idea to get a little distance and maybe go into another room at night. Um, you know, originally I started working with, you know, earbuds and things like that, but then that can block your natural ear drainage and cause issues there. So yeah, a couple nights a week, I go off to my chamber, my chambre, and have my own space. But um, uh, mugwort, yep, yeah, Chinese medicine. Yeah, it's also the Koreans too. I was uh, doing some research on this before the talk, Lynn. And I was reading in Korean culture as well, you know, the, the mugwort is uh, used in hot baths, right? So there's another way that you can prepare and use the herb to help you rest and, and get into that dreaming. You know, um, culturally, historically, shamanically, right? We know the magical relationship with plants for prophecy and 
seeing the unseen goes back a long, long time ago for eons, right? We see it in the Bible, like in Christina's talk today about the serpent magic. We think of the, the origin myth, the origin tale of the Garden of Eden. Uh, think Moses and the burning bush, right? Um, of course, now we know, botanists can tell us, that a lot of the acacias in the region actually contain high amounts of DMT, dimethyltryptamine. So, um, you know, yeah. So Moses is getting his, you know, talk on with the divine thanks to uh, dimethyltryptamine, which is also a naturally occurring substance that we carry in our bodies seated right up here, right? In the third eye. I don't know if uh, any of you guys are Dr. Rick Strassman fans, but if you have interest in DMT at all, I highly recommend his work. Now, um, if we want to go back to cave times, we see it in the cave drawings, especially the sacred mushroom. And, you know, we're talking about plant magic. We're talking about animal magic this week, plant medicine, animal medicine. And I really feel the mushroom vacillates between animal and plant. Biologically, it has the essence of both, you know. Um, Oh, Nordics did use it in beer. Yeah. See, you guys are so smart. I am so preaching to the choir on this, right? Let's all sing the praises of plants. <laughs> but I wanted to share with you um, that uh, uh, my dear friend, the late Terrence McKenna said, it's no great accomplishment to hear voices in your head. The accomplishment is making sure they're telling the truth. And I'm sure I'm paraphrasing there. But um, I wanted to share uh, something he had actually written about the mushroom. And this was when he was writing under a pseudonym, OTOS, uh, about our fungal friends. I am old, older than your species, which in itself is 50 times older than your history. Though I've been on earth for ages, I am from the stars. My home is no one planet. For many worlds scattered through the shining disk of the, the galaxy have conditions which allow my spores, wait, I have to turn the page. It's a page turner, guys, which allow my spores opportunity for life. Since it's not easy for you to recognize other varieties of intelligence around you, your most advanced theories of politics and society have only advanced as far as the notion of collectivism. But beyond the cohesion of the members of a species into a single organism, there lie richer, even more Baroque evolutionary possibilities. Symbiosis is one of these, right? So he goes on to speak about the cooperative relationship between plants and animals in our own species and panspermia, okay? Uh, panspermia is the idea that mushrooms or other fungi or other microorganisms, bacteria, etc., hitched a ride on space dust and meteoroids and asteroids, comets, etc., you know, and kind of crash landed here on our planet. So the mycelial network, right, this network that's under the ground that the fungus, the trees, um, they all speak on, they all communicate on, right? There's this mycelium net that exists underneath our ground, underneath our feet. And the higher animals with manipulative abilities can become partners with star knowledge through this network, uh, through working with these plant teachers, with these fungal teachers. So um, there's connection to the stars by going into the earth and working with the plants. Does that make sense to you guys? It's interesting stuff, right? Any star seeds in the audience? Do we have any star seeds here today? Fungi is its own thing for sure. Yep. Yep. Uh, hey, Amanda. Welcome. I see you've just joined us too, just a bit. I mean, all right. Well, there's so much to unpack here, right? Let's swing it on back to, to mugwort and dreaming. So mugwort, oh gosh, it's everywhere, right? Lynn brought up earlier that, you know, used in Chinese herbalism, etc. Mugwort is a common name for several species of aromatic flowering plants in the genus Artemisia, right? I love the name Artemis. Some of you know why. <laughs> Very much into my Greek studies, etc. 
in the West, mugwort was, um, you know, referred to this particular plant in the Western version of the plant. It's got lots of cousins. There's lots of little variants in it. But um, I'm talking specifically about Artemisia vulgaris or common mugwort, right? You can see this, you know, you're coming off the freeway, you look to your right, oh, there's mugwort. You know, it's like you're looking in a field, oh, there's mugwort. I mean, it's just everywhere. So um, I mentioned that there are different kinds, right? Uh, one of which uh, is its close cousin, Artemisia absinthium, right? That's wormwood, the psychoactive ingredient in absinthe, the green fairy, right? So folk etymology tells us that um, based on coinc you know, coincidental sounds, mugwort comes from the word mug, right? It's been used in flavoring drinks, potions for so long. Uh, since the early Iron Age, actually, mugwort has been used for forever. Other sources on the etymology say that it's derived from the Old Norse, right? Uh, what is it? Muji? I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Or Muggy, it's, it's meaning marsh. Um, in German, we've got Wurz or Wort in Old English, and uh, that means root. So, you know, it's been used since ancient times to do all sorts of things like repelling insects. It's a natural insect repellent. It's been used um, oftentimes too to ward off moths, right? Um, what else? Let's see. It's, uh, as I said, easy to find everywhere across fields all over the globe. It contains a thujone, which is a monoterpene. And, um, you know, terpenes are those oils inside of plants. When you listen to Amanda this week, when you listen to Desiree, I'm sure they're going to get into speaking a little bit about terps when they talk about, um, you know, essential oils and extracts and whatnot. Um, but um, it's uh, got thujone in it, which is also an active ingredient in, in juniper where we get gin, right? So mugwort gets around it's got a lot of uses all the plant all the parts of the plant contain you know these essential these you know essential oils like i said that you know can harm bug larvae but they're really great and beneficial for us so um you know and that was used to flavor beer as uh, uh christina pointed out i also had found out that the roman soldiers when they'd be on long marches and god knows that empire went everywhere right um, soldiers would grab it off the roadside and put it in their sandals into the soles of the feet. You know, the bottom of the foot is super absorbent, right, for different types of herbs and, and plants. So they would do that. It's also said that John the Baptist wore a girdle of mugwort. Now, John the Baptist was an Essene. And the Essenes are no strangers to plant medicines, plant rituals, and ecstatic states of consciousness, right? So, um, you know, we see a long history, long, long history, and I'm just barely scratching the surface here on this, but, you know, mugwort has been associated with dreams and ecstatic states of consciousness for a long time. In fact, the First Nations peoples of North America used mugwort for a number of medicinal purposes. Uh, it was strong and bitter tasting. Um, you could use it to flavor meats, um, a sage wart tea was taken to treat colds and fevers. Mugwort was used in washes and salves to treat bruising and itching. Um, they would make it dried and, and then crush it up and use it as a, a snuff uh, to help with nosebleeds, and headaches. Plants were boiled to make washes and um, poultices for swollen feet. See, we're back to this, the feet thing, right? Um, and uh, some tribes refer to mugwort as women's sage because it was taken often to correct menstrual irregularity. Now, that being said, it's wise to stay away from mugwort if you're pregnant or nursing. You know, it really stimulates the uterus and whatnot. So, um, you know, spontaneous abortion, you know, that's a risk for people who are pregnant and um, using mugwort. So. But remember again that that um, name, that Artemisia, right? Artemis, it's the moon ladies. There's a big connection here with mugwort and our lunar cycles. Um, you know, speaking of indigenous tribes, the tribe that is um, around the area where I am in Southern California, the Chumash considered mugwort to be their dreaming sage.
Now, while there's a ton of scientific study and evidence around all of the characteristics that I just mentioned about mugwort, there is not much scientific, scientific methodical study on mugwort and dreaming. However, the testimonial and anecdotal evidence is off the hook, right? I got to take a breath here and check in on you guys. Yep, painful feet. Mugwort's great for painful feet. Desiree's here, says it's good for skin conditions. I'm telling you guys, this is a miracle freaking plant. This needs to become one of your friends. It needs to become one of your allies if you don't work with it. I highly recommend introducing yourself and, and getting to know this plant. Um, I work with it mainly in the form of teas, but we mentioned before um, it's used in many different ways. Lynn brought up Chinese herbalism. I mentioned the Koreans take hot baths with it. Um, you know, uh, yeah, it's used in moxibustion, moxibustion in Asia for sure. Um, you can, you know, you can even smoke it, right? It's like you can hand roll it, you can water pipe it. Um, but I find a calming brew of tea is just easy. You know, the dry leaves, the roots, the flowers, the stems are all fine to help us get off to dreamland. And you can also work with their scent as an anirogen. What's an anirogen, right? right? Well, that comes from the Greek, but an anirogen is a plant that's going to help us to dream. Um, I mentioned before to be cautious with this herb, you should be cautious with any herb, with anything you ingest, right? Everything from chocolate to morphine is a drug and you have to make sure that you as a walking chemistry system, that you are safe to use this particular compound. You know, some people can't handle, you know, uh, chocolate, peanut butter, etc. Um, there are people who are allergic to mugwort if they maybe have a birch, celery, or wild carrot allergy. And yes, this has a very scientific name, this condition. It's called the celery carrot mugwort spice syndrome. Wow, who came up with that one? <laughs> but yeah, you know, this, you know, take my talk with a grain of salt because um, not everyone uh, is suited to work with every single, you know, plant ally out there, you know. Um, there are some people who might have an allergy to royal jelly or honey. Um, it even can affect people who have a latex allergy, for example, right. But for myself and for most, mugwort is a safe plant teacher and ally to work with. And I mentioned it was an anirogen, right. So thus began my onironaut story, right. Anironautics is the ability to travel within your dream, right? So lucid dreamers are called onironauts. So again, a lucid dream is one where the dreamer is conscious of the experience in the dream, right? And uh, again, onironaut, I'm going to spell that for you guys if you want to look it up. It's O-N-E-I-R-O-N-A-U-T. So the plants that we use in our journeys in the dreamscapes are anirogens. So mugwort is a very effective anirogen for the liminal dream space, right? We touched on it at the beginning of the talk, but the liminal space, the liminal state of consciousness is different than the lucid state. To get to the lucid state, I recommend first practicing with liminal states of consciousness. I'm going to grab a quick drink here. Hold on. Da, da, da. A little tea. Mm. Liminal states of consciousness. Here we go. Ah, someone's saying they have a sachet under their bed with mugwort, star anise, rosemary for dream protection. Oh, that's a nice one. Nice one. All right. Yeah, uh, making sachets like the little sachets are just great. So liminal dreams guys right liminal states of consciousness you know uh, a few weeks ago christina had published something about waking up in the morning and not being quite sure if she was awake or asleep this is a liminal state of consciousness that's called hypnopompia hypnopompia that's when we're waking up right we're on that edge remember liminal states are about being on the edge or an in-between state so Hypnopompia, that's when we're coming out of sleep. 
the contrasting state of consciousness when we're going into sleep is hypnagogia, right? So these are the states between wakefulness and sleep. Hypnagogia can oftentimes be marked by many, like as you're falling asleep. I mean, like I said, my husband will jerk around like, you know, he's asleep. He's on the edge of it. He's fine. But it, it wakes me back up when he's having what we call these hypnic jerks, these, spas these spasmodic responses, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I was going to, you know, make a joke that makes him the king of the jerks, but that's not nice. And he's not here. And when he watches this, he'll be mad at me. But they're hypnic jerks. That's what they're called. So these liminal stages are quite magical states of being. In hypnagogia and hypnopompia, you are both awake and asleep while also being neither. In the liminal dream world, you straddle the dream world and the waking world. You know, you're not fully asleep. You're not fully awake. You are aware of your physical environment. You're aware that you're in your bed or in your chair or wherever you are. You can identify sounds around you, you know, if there are conversations around or people are talking, you know, you're perceiving that, you're understanding that. You might even, you know, if you have the TV or the radio on, it's like you're aware of that, but you're asleep and awake at the same time, okay? It's, it's a very interesting state. Now, when you're in this state, a lot of problem solving and creative um, activity can occur, right? And a lot of psychic activity can occur, right? This is kind of the same space that a lot of us go into when we're moving into a trance space. Um, you know, I think of, you know, I'm very much into mythology and uh, creation myths. You know, I think of the aboriginals talking about the dream time and the world being um, sung into, ex you know, our modern experience or uh, it's the dream time, right? Uh, it's the sacred origin. It literally overlays both waking consciousness and sleep. You know, there are Aboriginal like tales where someone's, you know, here in the waking world and then suddenly they're transported speaking to, you know, some serpent lizard, you know, person in another dimension. And then they can zap right back to, you know, um, wherever they were just moments ago. So this liminal space, it's logical and linear, it's creative, it's intuitive, all mixed into one. Now, Thomas Edison and Salvador Dali, there are, you know, infamous stories about both of them um, working in this space for their creativity, for their inventiveness. In both cases, the inventor and the surrealist painter would allow themselves to fall asleep while sitting in a chair, right? Next to them, they'd have uh, like a metal plate on the floor. Uh, Edison would hold a ball in his hand. Salvador Dali would hold a brass key, right? And as they would start to drip off, uh, what would happen, right? What would happen? The ball would drop, the key would drop onto the metal plate, make a clatter, and it would wake them up. Now, respectively, one, respectively, one had a notebook, uh, the other one had their sketchbook, and, you know, when they would come out of this, you know, falling asleep, you know, hypnagogic state, they would immediately write down whatever impressions they had. They would write down what visualizations they had, what, what symbols they were seeing, what ideas they had. So it's a very interesting space. And again, working in this liminal space is a precursor to practicing lucid dreams if you're new to it. There are some folks in our group, I can see by the comments already, who are already pros at this lucid dreaming thing, right? So, hypnagogia. You know, another um, thing I wanted to share about how I work with hypnagogia is, um, you know, I'm a uh, yoga teacher, certified yoga teacher, and during lockdown, I was uh, giving the gift of a weekly yoga nidra. What's yoga nidra? It's the yoga of sleep. So on a weekly basis, I would do a little broadcast with some of my students and we would intentionally go into a state of hypnagogia to get ourselves into relaxation, to get ourselves into a creative space, you know? So yeah, hypnagogia and hypnopompia, all right? These are states where we're both awake and asleep. You'll probably, you know, want to learn a little bit about how to remember 
these things, right? A lot of us, when we wake up, it's as if we suddenly get amnesia, right? Well, that's why having the, um, the uh, notebook handy is a good idea. And um, I also recommend having, um, you know, a voice recorded or a voice activated recording app around. It's not so bad. But I'm going to just go through some steps for this again if you want to try it. Is that okay? All right. I'm going to go through these steps. If you want to, you know, you know, do what Dali did. If you want to do what Edison did, right? Respected luminaries in our culture who worked with these liminal states. You know, uh, I suggest trying it in a chair. If you can't possibly do it in a chair, lay down. But make sure you're laying on the edge that your arm would be near the edge of the mattress, the bed, the sofa. Wait until you feel naturally sleepy. Um, some people get worn out by four in the afternoon. It, some people, you know, right before bed, you can try this. It depends on your personal relationship to the circadian rhythms of your body and, and the world around you. So if you're sitting just sim comfortably in your chair, um, you're going to need to hold on to something that's going to make a lot of noise, right? Something that's going to make a big clatter, something loud when you drop it. Like, you know, they did the metal plate thing. Uh, you could use, I don't know, do you have a dog toy that makes noise or something that jingles? Do you have a bell in the house? Just anything that's going to make like a loud noise, right? So keep something next to you to record your ideas when this happens, right? Like I said, I love to work with a voice activated recording app on my phone. That's easy. Um, but I also suggest, you know, the sketchbook thing, you know, when you come out of it, draw what you see, draw what you feel. It doesn't matter if you're considering yourself a great artist like Dali. The important thing is to get these ideas on paper because the symbols the information that's being shown to you, as I said, is oftentimes very prophetic, you know. Um, I mentioned that, um, you know, yoga nidra is a great way to experience, experiment with this space. And later on when I chat with you guys about my offer and what we're going to do um, uh, as a group, I propose, uh, we're going to get into that space through yoga nidra, you know. Anyway, try those steps if you're new to this idea of liminal dreaming. If you're new to this idea of lucid dreaming, give it a shot. You know, see what comes up for you and, and come back and share that with me in this group or, you know, stay in touch with me. I'll share my social media and contact information after this. But, you know, I just want to point out, too, when people hear yoga nidra, a lot of people who aren't yogis think, oh, am I going to have to stand on my head? No, anyone can practice yoga nidra. There's one pose, and what's that? Shavasana, the dead man's pose, the corpse pose. So the entire practice is done lying down, and then the, um, the leader, the facilitator, myself, takes you through a guided meditation. Um, so it's very easy to practice. All you need to do is listen to the sound of your breath and follow along with the suggestions, you know? But uh, as I said, I could go on and on forever about this stuff. And some may argue I already have. But I want to jump back over to the idea now of lucid dreaming and my other favorite plant for this, which is the blue lotus. Now, not to be confused with blue lily. It's a little bit different. This is Nalembo nucifera. Thousands of years of history across cultures from the Mayan to the Syrian the Thai, the Egyptian work with the blue lotus. Anyone here familiar with blue lotus? Oh, hey, Heidi's saying yoga nidra is her jam. Right on. I knew I liked you. I knew it. Um, anyone here familiar with blue lotus? Blue lotus. So here is this amazing, beautiful, intoxicatingly scented flower, right? It's got an inebriating effect. We see it from culture to culture. Like I said, you know, it's like you go to a yoga studio, we see the lotus. We see it in um, Buddhism. We see the Tibetan yogis in their dream yoga. And there's a lot of reference, a lot of reference to the blue lotus. Now, the blue lotus was also a bit of an ancient Egyptian party drug, a little party elixir. Um, it's seen in a lot of artwork that has to do with sensuality and sexuality and sacred sex acts. Um, it's also considered sort of like a female Viagra, right? 
there's a bunch of papyruses, you guys, that have all sorts of randy pictures on them that feature the blue lotus. So uh, very feminine, very sexual. Um, the thing that's really neat about the uh, blue lotus, too, is here you've got this, this flower that, that is under the water, right? The, this blossom, this bloom is under the water, and it rises up, rises up maybe around 9 in the morning and opens, 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 opens right, and sticks around for a bit and then closes and recedes back into the water, sort of like a, a sunrise, sundown kind of motion to it, right. So this flower is this beautiful, beautiful color and, uh, you know, this bluish indigo color, right. Think about our chakras and what that color represents, right. And then on the inside are these oranges and yellows. So essentially you saw the sky, right? Here's this blue sky with this yellow sun in the middle, if you will, right? Blue sky, yellow sun in the middle that rises and falls. So therefore, it had um, a very big resident resonance with Ra, the sun god, and Nui, the sky goddess. So we've got this flower that's a, a stimulant, a sedative, an aphrodisiac, right? Sort of a, a triple threat. Now, there are many ways of preparing blue lotus, like mugwort. There's extracts, there's tinctures. People can make resin from blue lotus out of their sticky leaves. Um, you can work with dried leaves. There's uh, essential oils via steam distillation. There are people that actually have created blue lotus pills as supplements, right? With the, the dried herb inside, you can use it as a poultice, a sachet. A massage oil, you know, working with blue lotus as a massage oil is wonderful because it seeps through the skin. You can take a hot herbal bath or you can make a tea, right? You know, um, those leaves make a beautiful tea, right? This purpley blue color. I mentioned earlier that one of my early plant teachers was Damiana, was valerian root. And to induce rest and sleep with my tea, I used Damiana. A little catnip, right? Catnip, while it makes the cats crazy, it's really got a sedative effect for us. Um, I put in a little chamomile, a little lavender. Um, you know, again, we're all walking chemistry sets. So certain things work for certain folks. Um, maybe a little wild lettuce that goes in there too. Um, many people report blue lotus as having highly psychoactive effects when it's smoked. Um, not that I'm advocating smoking for anyone because we know combustion and the lungs over the long term are not the best thing. But, you know, in toxicology, poison makes the dose. You know, if you drink uh, a ton of soda every day, it'll probably kill you. But if you have one once in a while, you'll probably survive. But yeah, so Blue Lotus is really great for the lucid dreaming phase of, of dreaming um, and getting into there. So. Uh, it was also really big in Greek tradition. You know, the Greeks had these dreaming temples, right? Today in Christina's chat, we were talking about um, uh, Asclepius or Asclepius. You know, I'm always terrible with my Greek pronunciation as much as I love that. But he was the Dr. Demigod of Greek mythology. And his temples were dreaming spaces. People would come and be... Um, attended to by the temple attendants and taking ritual baths and doing certain, you know, teas and um, food preparations. And then there were some things that required fasting. And the idea was that the demigod doctor would appear to you in your dream and then provide for you symbols and information. Upon waking, the priests of the temple would then listen to the tale of your dream and then create a path of healing for you based upon what you had in the dream. So um, there are um, a lot of dream incubation techniques that we can talk about. And we're coming to the end here. I, it's, it's hard to get all of this in. But um, this is sort of that same headspace in the lucid dreams that we are in when we're in like hypnotherapy and whatnot. But What's great about Blue Lotus, too, is it not only helps with the vivid lucid dreams, it helps with recall. Remember at the beginning, I was convinced I couldn't dream because I didn't really have the recall, right? So 
Um, working with lucid dreams, the first thing you want to do after the liminal practice is getting into making sure you have the practice of remembering dreams themselves, not just sleeping in the chair on the edge and, and dropping something, right? And, and writing stuff down, actually going to sleep and getting into a lucid dream. Lucid dreams occur probably for, um, with, during the REM stage, probably after about the sixth hour of sleep. Uh, there are many people who are advanced practitioners who will set their alarms for after five or six hours of sleep and take an anirogen. They will take, um, you know, teas or take certain capsules and go back to sleep, or they would wake up and um, maybe write some things down uh, and then go back in. Um, you know, there's all sorts of techniques, and unfortunately, it's too much for our time today. But um, one of the ways, really quick, that people will check in with themselves to see if they're dreaming is... Um, you know, using what they call reality checks, right? These are like, um, here, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the ways I'll make sure that I'm conscious in a lucid dream is before I go to bed, I might, as I'm starting to close my eyes, look at my hand, right? And I'll say to myself, tonight when I'm dreaming, when I look at my hands, I'll know I'm in a dream, right? People use things like their hands, they use clocks, they use um, all sorts of things as reality checks, you know? And um, I know we've got to go soon, but I wanted to also uh, maybe give you guys a technique that I used early on to remember my dreams, right? A triggering technique. Um, I would bring a glass of water to my bed and I would have a sip. And as I'm sipping before I drift off to sleep, I would tell myself that in the morning I would have another sip of water and I would give myself permission to remember my dreams, right? So having sort of a, a ritual that goes full circle, right? You might not want to do the drink of water. You might want to say, oh, when I look at my clock as I'm going to sleep, when I look at it again in the morning, I'll remember my dreams. So, you know, um, having these devices really helps. Um, your mobile phone is a great recall tool. Like I said, downloading an app that is voice activated is wonderful. If you don't like the voice activated apps, uh, you can just put it on your home screen on your phone. But when you wake up in the morning, right, that, that hypnopompia state we talked about before you, you know, look through your emails or do anything, stay lying down, stay in that position and start speaking into your phone and uh, all the details you can think of. Then later, go back and transcribe that into a dream journal. Having a dream journal is really, really, really smart and important. Um, I got a time check here and we're coming towards the end, my goodness. Like I said, there's so much to unpack here, you guys. You know, but we covered a lot of these things, reality checks, etc. cetera. Um, we talked about the Greek temple thing a bit. You know, so many of us in here see each other just as like a little profile picture and our names, be they our professional psychic names or our personal names. And we see each other in, uh, you know, the psychic hotline group. We see each other in, you know, all of Christina's groups. And I thought it might be interesting for us to incubate some group dreaming experiences together. So I thought it would be a blast to do a virtual psychedelic slumber party um, where we would meet online in our own version of a cyber temple dream lab. Um, we do it on a predetermined date. I imagine maybe like maybe a Saturday night and a Sunday morning, right? Um, maybe for like an hour, 90 minutes on the first night where we do a, a yoga nidra together. Um, preceding that, we would, um, you know, chat a little bit, get to know each other, and talk a bit about our plant allies and our experiences with dreaming. Then, upon awakening, and of course, working with our own choice of plant allies, right? Prepared the way you want. Some people might want to ingest something. Some people might want to uh, work with something olfactoral, a scent, you know. And then, awakening the next day, we can reconvene and share notes. And perhaps we'll have some shared dreams that we can discuss. Um, and I'd like to chat with you guys upon waking about the effects that we experience. 
Um, you know, did we experience those hypnic jerks in hypnagogia? Um, what did you experience when you woke up in your hypnopompia? We want to talk about REM stages. We want to talk about fugue states. We want to talk about, you know, I'll send some emails about these other little things that I didn't have time to cover in the talk. But, you know, I think it'd be wonderful to see, you know, who felt like they even had out of body experiences as a result of working with these techniques and working with these plants. So um, what I imagine then too is we would, you know, have a couple emails going out to you prior to the event, um, you know, discussing the different types of preparations, different sources to procure these things. And, um, you know, I think it could be a lot of fun because like I said, we, you know, only see each other as little blips on the screen. And it would be a lovely thing to do. Um, scheduling wise, I'd like to do it by summer's end. Um, if uh, there's enough interest, maybe I'll break it off into two groups. I will be um, taking registrations through the Spirit Phoenix Academy. And at the end here, I'll put in some links there. And uh, if you're interested, come check it out. Um, but again, gifts, right? Free gift time, right? <laughs> um, the first gift that I wanted to give, uh, I shared at the beginning, is my ebook. And you saw the cover maybe when you came into the room at the beginning of the lecture um, Planting the Seeds of Lucid and Liminal Dreaming. And it's my specialized report on how to pay attention to dreams and gets more into the lucid dreaming ideas there, which is good because we ran out of time here today. But, you know, Lucid dreaming can help you inject more meaning and magic into your life, into your prophecy, your psychic world. Um, there are people who are working with healing in the dream states, healing not only themselves, but others, you know, having those intentions. Um, also, when uh, you sign up to get that free gift, um, you'll receive an email that has the connections to where to get all these goodies, right? Where to download them, etc. But I'll also um, give you an Anirogen plant ally recipe for um, how I do my mugwort tea, a real simple one. And uh, then I also have an, an Egyptian blue lotus um, perfume recipe there. So it's a, if you're feeling a little chemistry vibe, you know, check that out. So that will be available to you. Um, also, so many of us in this psychic space, in this magical space, in the clear space, suffer from what? Imposter syndrome. I see it a lot in the post. So if you've ever had doubts about your magical gifts, your psychic skills, this booklet is for you. I have a, another ebook that I'm thrilled to give you for free. Um, it comes with a 21-day action plan to get over imposter syndrome. So that one's entitled Imposter Syndrome, What It Is and How to Overcome Its Shadow. And then, like I said, the added bonus right behind me, you can see the Evil Eye Black Lace Dream Catcher, right? Like I said, it is my number one seller in my Etsy shop. Um, so for folks who join three out of five of my social media groups, right? You know, you can choose from my Etsy or my YouTube, you can follow there. You can uh, follow me on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Uh, if you email me just a screenshot that you've, you've done that, I will enter your name in a random drawing to get this really groovy um, dream catcher. I love this thing. In fact, while I'm sitting here, I keep getting notices from my Etsy store going, so-and-so favored your black lace dream catcher. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah. I'm starting to um, realize just how dry my throat is. Thank you guys for putting up with the raspiness. I feel like I could do a Stevie Nicks kind of thing right now. But anyway, so yeah, um, you know, feel free to follow me in those places and I'll get you all these freebies. At the close of this chat, I will be putting up the, um, in fact, I can probably put it up right now while we're talking. Um, we are going to, where is it, where is it, where is it? Have you guys go visit me at my little opt-in page here. I'm going to put up a little banner with that right now, see if it goes. Otherwise, come back and I will get that to you in the comments. Let me see if that will go on. Boop. There it is. 
anyway, um, thanks again for showing up today. I wish I could share even more. In fact, you know, going through this process made me realize that it might not be a bad idea for me to put together a mini course in the Academy for lucid dreaming. And as I said, um, you'll be going to visit the Academy anyway. Um, if you want to come do this psychic delic slumber party with me, I think it'd be a blast. Bring your sleep shades. Um, I think it would be a lot of fun. So I just wanted to know before we go, does anyone have any questions or any other comments they want to share? Maybe, perhaps. Let's see who's here. Oh, hey, Katie. Hey, Pamela. When did you sneak in here? Did I say hi to you before? Hmm. I'm not sure. Anyway, hey, Kirsten. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to just hang out here for a moment or two and see if there are any questions because, you know, there's that bit of a broadcast gap between me sending it out to you and you guys receiving it on Facebook. There is that little bit of a, a lull. Let's see here. Oh, you're welcome, Katie. And thank you, Vila. Thank you, Lynn. You guys are great. Well, like I said, you can, um, you know, catch me at the subscribe page. Right you there. And uh, you have access to all the free gifts and a chance to win a little dream catcher. They're pretty cool. I dig them. It's pretty big. Maybe I should go grab it and show it to you so you can see the size better. It's hard to see the size back there, but I realize it's hard to see because it's um, so see-through, right? It's pretty groovy, but these things are pretty long. Black lace, how goth. Anyway, all right, you guys. Um, I wish you all a marvelous summer of magic. I wish you all an amazing hotline girl summer. Um, and to all the other presenters, Lots of love and best of luck to you this week and to all the attendees. Thank you so much for, you know, taking time out of your precious day. You being here is a gift for all of us. And thanks again to Miss Christina Quick for hosting the Summer of Magic. Okay. You guys take care. All right. Look for, and if you have any other questions, put them in the comments. I'll be hanging around the next month in the Summer of Magic group anyway. Take care. Namaste.